Um, Ruth Coles Harris was one of our honorees for this year's Strong Men and Women in Virginia History Project. And Laura Netley from the Virginia Historical Society will be leading an informal conversation with her about some of her achievements. Um, Memorial Day is coming up, so the library will actually be closed on Saturday, May 23rd and Monday, May 25th. So if you are a frequent researcher, please make note of those dates because you might be here, but we will not. <laughs> Um, if you have not had a chance to see our current exhibit, To Be Sold, Virginia and the American Slave Trade, I would encourage you to go ahead and do so because that exhibit will actually be closing on May 30th. May 30th is the last day that exhibit will be open. And on May 29th, we are going to have our final event related to that exhibit when Maureen McGinnis, who is the curator, is going to come and give a talk, Slaves Waiting for Sale, Abolitionist Art in the American Slave Trade. So that talk is on May 29th at noon, and the exhibit closes the next day on May 30th. Um, one more little bit of housekeeping. A lot of you will have noticed that there's little index card shaped things scattered throughout the auditorium. At the end of the program, if you could just fill those out and either give it to myself um, or leave it at the table by the front door. Um, it just lets us know how did you hear about the program, uh, did you enjoy it? Did you learn something? So it, it lets us know a little bit about your experience today. So if you could please fill those out. If you don't have one near you, there are a few more and also pencils provided at the table out front when you walked in. So now I'd actually like to introduce our speaker for today. Uh, Greg Crawford he is the Local Records Service Program Manager here at the library. He is a native, actually not a Virginia native, he's a native of Alabama where he was a graduate of Auburn University. He received his bachelor's and master's degree in history there. And Greg joined the library staff in 1999 as a local records archivist. So ladies and gentlemen, will you please welcome to the podium, Greg Crawford. Well, don't get used to me being behind the podium for very long. I'm a son of a preacher, so that means I have to walk around while I talk, so, uh, uh, today we're going to talk about a project that's been going on here at the library for a couple years now called the African American Narrative Project, and uh, the, the impetus for this uh, was, uh, was a lot of the good work that Virginia Historical Society has been doing with their Unknown No Longer uh, collection. In, uh, Database, database, and uh, images on, that they have online, and that kind of this got us looking at our collections and what we have here. And we, you know, we got a ton of stuff here at the Library of Virginia, various collections, as you'll see in this uh, presentation, uh, that relate and illuminate African American history uh, going back to the colonial days. So, um, want to thank Virginia Historical Society for. Uh, Help getting us motivated on that, so appreciate it. Um, to begin my uh, to begin the presentation, I want to start with a, with a story that uh, a narrative that was found that's been found in our collection to give you an idea of the importance, the motivation for doing a project such as this. It's, uh, it's a story of Jane Webb. I'm going to take you back to 1701. Jane Webb is a, uh, she's a mulatto, she's free, she's a free mulatto. Uh, her mother was white, but she doesn't say who her father was. She doesn't say if he was African American or if he was Native American. 
but she was she she so but she was a mulatto and she was a free person. Now around 1701, she was near the this is in Northampton County on the eastern shore, and she was uh, you know familiar with the estate of Thomas Savage, and what and she fell in love with one of the slaves owned by Thomas Savage, and she wanted to marry him. Okay, again, it's 1701. And so she makes a, an agreement with Thomas Savage, uh, her, um, you know, the slave's master, saying, I will work for you for seven years. I will bind myself to you for seven years. But then at the end of that seven years, I want, I want to be able to marry the slave named Left. His name was Left. I want to be able to marry him. And by the way, if we have any children... During this time when I'm bound out to you, uh, they are also to be made free at the end of this seven-year period. My husband and my children are all to be made free after the seven years of working for you. Okay? Thomas Savage makes the agreement. They have a document. She makes her mark on the document. He signs his name, and they have the agreement, and she's bound out to him for seven years. Seven years comes and goes. At the end of the seven years, Jane goes to Thomas Savage and says, My time of service to you has ended. Please free my husband, free my children, based on the agreement that we made. Savage's response was basically, What agreement? I don't know what you're talking about. She says, You know, we, uh, we signed this document saying, you know, that you would do this. I would do this for you, you would do this for me. He says, No, I don't recall that. And so her husband remains a slave. Her children are bound out, not as slaves, but as like apprentices or indentured servants to Thomas Savage. He goes to court and asks the court to bind out Jane's children to him, to live with him and, and, and to work for him and to serve him for a significant period of time. And, you know, Jane was like, this is not right. And so she goes through the court system in Northampton County in order to win the freedom of her children, to get her children back. This is a petition here from the 1700s in which Jane Will is given the background of all I just told you and is, is asking the court to please free her, you know, give the children back to her. Okay? And, and the case ends in 1722 and the court, the the court's response to her petition was, the argument made by the plaintiff is frivolous and therefore dismissed. And so she goes to another, she goes through the court system again. She goes, she makes several petitions and goes to the court to get her, win her children back. This is over a 20 year period I'm talking about. And then in the, during that time when she lost another case and the children were, were, were still bound out to Thomas Savage, she let out a frustrated cry, and she said something that got her in trouble. This is in the order book of Northampton County. It's kind of hard to read what she said here, but they quote her statement. This is what she said out loud for everyone to hear. If all the Virginia Negroes had as good as heart as she, they would all be free. People, white people heard her say that went to the sheriff and said, she said something inflammatory. She should be punished. They took her before the court. The court ordered that she was to be immediately whipped on her bare back, ten with ten lashes. And in that same order book, it says that order that Jane Webb, having received her punishment, the ten lashes, she was discharged and she had to pay court costs. This woman was just trying to free her children. Get her children back. Get her husband back. And it, these court documents here, the story, the brief story that I shared with you were found in these half a dozen or so court documents from Northampton County. These court documents were spread out in different areas of the courthouse. But when they were transferred here to the Library of Virginia, we were able to put the story together, going from judgments to chancery to petitions and so forth. Now, the story like Jane Webb that I shared with you is just one of thousands here. This, the Library of Virginia houses local court records, state records, personal papers, business records, newspapers, 
special collections, books, journals that date back to the 1600s. Collectively, these records contain the names of thousands of African Americans, slave and free. This is how these start out, though. This is in a courthouse. And these documents, like Jane Webb's court cases, were originally filed in bundles inside of drawers. Throughout Virginia, you've, you'll find courthouses like this, where the, the records are bound up like this, so tightly packed. But in these bundles are Jane Webb's story, and the stories of other African Americans. And I just, in my mind, when I go and look at these drawers, when I visit courthouses and I see these drawers full of bundles, I say, I listen for the voices. There's voices inside those drawers. There's voices inside those bundles saying, I have a story. Share it. Tell somebody. And so what we do at the Library of Virginia is, with the local court records and state records and so forth, archivists are flat filing, they're identifying, they're indexing, and in some cases scanning these documents in order to get these stories out and share their stories. Sometimes we find them in this shape. Sometimes they're file stored in filing cabinets like this. Sometimes we find them in like this, in attics or courthouses or private homes or so forth. But we were able to go through records like these and able to salvage and save many of these documents, flatten them, get them conserved, get them stored and so forth, so that you can have access to them. Now, the names that are found in these documents are not just names. They're access points to the stories. The names are access points to individual stories of African Americans who lived in Virginia from like the colonial era up until 1865 when slavery came to an end. Now, so far, uh, thanks to a grant from Dominion Power, Dominion Power enabled us to hire a couple, two part-time staff. Uh, Ed, Chris, could y'all stand up, please? No, Ed's here, Chris. These two gentlemen for the last year and a half have been indexing 64,000 names, scanning 36,000 documents, and, and they're, been, again, like I said, it's been funded through a Dominion grant, so we're thankful to the Dominion Power for their help with this. But that's what they've done so far. Now, some of the documents that they have uh, looked at and scanned uh, briefly are legislative petitions. In Virginia, between 1776 and 1860, up until about 1865, uh, citizens of Virginia could petition the General Assembly for just about anything and everything under the sun. They could petition for a divorce, to get a road built, to get a school built, for uh, military pensions, uh, religious freedom. But also African Americans are involved in these legislative petitions. A lot of these cases involve the state uh, matters and so forth, and so you'll find names of African Americans who are involved in these petitions. But also African Americans themselves could petition the General Assembly. Usually it was to remain in the Commonwealth. Because in the 1800s, after 1806, basically after 1806, if an African American was freed or emancipated by a will or by a deed, according to Virginia law, they can only remain in the Commonwealth for 12 months. After 12 months, they had to leave to go to a free state. So if they wanted to remain in the Commonwealth, they would have to petition the General Assembly to get permission to do so. And they would get the, the, the signatures of people in the community to vouch for them that they can stay in the Commonwealth. Here is a, uh, this is a legislative petition uh, by Jeannie Parker of Surrey County, Virginia. She's an elderly woman. She was emancipated by her uh, slave owner. But the thing is, is she did not want to leave Virginia. Why didn't she want to leave Virginia? Well, she had family here. She had children here in Virginia. She didn't want to leave them. Her friends were here. And so she, she said in her petition, deeming it a, a, oppressive at her advanced period of life to be compelled to desert her native state, children, and friends to seek residence in some place unknown, some unknown quarter of the country, she hopes that the General Assembly, the legislature, would allow her to remain in the Commonwealth the rest of her life. This was the General Assembly's response. Rejected. Rejected. Well, we'll get to questions after, after the presentation. But I've seen one after the other, after another legislative petition saying rejected, rejected, rejected. Here is John Chavis of Chesterfield County. His, uh, his uh, children were filing a petition with the General Assembly to 
um, for a military pension, to get a military pension. Why? John Chavis is a free African American who served in the Revolutionary War. Here's, you know, so you get a story of a free African American here serving in the Revolutionary War. His he, they can't find his, uh, you know, discharge papers or anything. It's been lost, been gone. It's been like 50 years later almost. But the, so in order to prove that he served in the Revolutionary War, they had to detail his term of service. When he entered, what did he do, who he served with, who he served under. So you get a history, a story of a free African American service during the Revolutionary War in these, revo in these legislative petitions. Which, by the way, this, this African American narrative is not just slave names, but it's also names of free African Americans. So it's going to be both free African Americans and slaves who's, you, who you'll find in this narrative database. Uh, the other types of records we're doing so far is coroner's inquisitions. Y'all know what a coroner does, don't you? What does a coroner do? Determines cause of death. Try to figure out how somebody died. And so we have a number, a lot of locality records that are coroner's inquisitions. And in these corner inquisitions, we discover there's a lot of slaves, a lot of slave names, a lot of dead slaves being discovered in a field or in, drowned in a river. Or in this case, this uh, is a slave named Jenny in Brunswick County was beaten to death by an overseer. And it gives a graphic description of her beating. Depositions of people who heard her being beaten, who heard her cries for mercy. There was one white individual, she said, I heard her, heard this overseer beat her for 30 minutes. And she's crying out to God for mercy. She's crying out to the man who's beating her for mercy. Nobody's hearing it. And that person did nothing to stop the beating. She just heard it. She said, it'll stop for 15, 20 minutes, and then it'll commence again until I heard nothing more. And in these corners, so in these corners, inquisitions, you see the tragic, the, 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 uh, disgusting nature of slavery, the, the, the pain, the physical pain, emotional pain. Because in these corner inquisitions, you not only see it references slaves who died due to beatings, but also have slaves who died uh, due to suicide, who committed suicide. You have uh, corner inquisitions of infanticide, where slaves were killing their children after they were, they were born. There's a lot of, those will break your heart. The infanticide corners inquisitions, and a lot. I mean, so you, you see here the the really the reality of slavery in the South in a lot of ways, the ugliness of it. Here we also got freedom suits. Freedom suits are where slaves could sue for their freedom. They could sue for their freedom if they were able to prove that they were descendants of Native Americans on their <coughs> other side, or if they were deported or brought into the state illegally or if they could prove that they were uh, emancipated by their master's deed or will. And so we have a number of freedom suits, and this is a freedom suit from Elizabeth, Elizabeth City County from the 1820s. Mar you got Margaret and others versus William Wilson and others. Margaret and the Excedra, the Excedra are eight brothers and sisters of Margaret, all slaves. Their mother was a slave, their father was a white slave owner. Their father's name was Willis. Willis had a brother named William. Now, Willis Wilson, when he, before he died, he wrote a will emancipating his children. But Willis's brother William said, no, that will was a fraud. His slave wife put him up to it. She tricked him into making this will, or she, it was some, you know, it, it was not a true will. He was not in his right mind. Came up with a lot of excuses. And so William Wilson refused to have Margaret and her brothers and sisters free. Well, Margaret and, Margaret and her brother and sister sued for their freedom against William Wilson. Now, one of the questions I had when I was reading through this is, why didn't uh, Willis have his brother William be the administrator of his estate? Why, didn't he get, why did he get some strange guy, some, one of his neighbors, to be the administrator of the estate? You think he would want blood kin to administer the estate. Well, the reason why is we discover in a deposition is that Willis's brother William said one time that in it was well known that his brother William had sold several of his own children. And if he will sell his own flesh and blood, certainly he could not trust him with his children. In other words, William had slave children and <coughs> sold them. And sold his children out of, the, out of the state. And so William, knowing that, did not want his, was knowing that, did not want his brother William to take care of his children and look after their welfare. 
So that's why he didn't make him an administrator of state. He was afraid to sell his children just like William did his own children. Other documents you'll find in the African American narrative are freedom certificates. If you're a free African American in Virginia, you had to have one of these that on you at all times. A piece of paper saying, acknowledging that you had received your freedom. You were, and then the information in the freedom certificate will be physical characteristics, color of skin, tone of color of skin, uh, scars, uh, height. And then also it would explain how you were emancipated, whether it was emancipated by the will or by the manumission, who your former owner was. You see how folded up, you can see the creases in the folds. They had to carry it in their pocket and wear them all their time, because if they lost that, it could be trouble. Uh, petitions of enslavement. Even if you, let's say, uh, you were, you know, you appealed, you petitioned the legislator, you petitioned the local uh, county to stay in the county or stay in the Commonwealth, but they reject it. So you have, you have two options. You can leave the Commonwealth, leave your family, go to a, a, a strange state, Ohio or Pennsylvania or somewhere like that. Or your other option was go back into slavery. And many former slaves who had received their freedom, who were, had been emancipated, Chuck did what Dennis Holt here did. Dennis Holt, a free man of color, color, was petitioning to remain in the Commonwealth. Why? Because he had married a slave. He, had, he was married to a slave and wanted to stay with her. So in order to stay with her, he chose to go back into slavery. Think about that for a moment. You have your freedom. You know your freedom but then you, you choose to go back into inservitude because of the love you have for someone. You want to stay with them. So that's what Dennis Holt chose to do. We also have business records and private papers and collections that will be a part of this narrative. This is, we have business records from Tredegar Iron Works, which was a major industry factory for, during the Civil War and supporting Civil War. Um, military, the Confederate military machine. In Richmond, Virginia, during the Civil War era, two thirds of the slaves who were in Richmond, Virginia, were hired out either in the tobacco warehouses or at Tredegar Ironworks. We have a list of slaves who were hired out by Tredegar Ironworks. These slaves were not made it to Richmond. They. We, slave, slave owners from throughout the Commonwealth were hiring out their slaves. Slave owners from Botetourt County, Allegheny County, Petersburg, Montgomery County, Spotsylvania. They needed the money. They were broke. And one of the ways they made money was by hiring out their slaves. And so they sent all their slaves to Richmond, hired them out to work in Threader. <coughs> so you had this mass migration within the Commonwealth of Virginia to Richmond of slaves. It makes me wonder. I don't think when the war ended in April 1865, they all went back to by the top to Allegheny to wherever. But through this here, you can, you know, if you're doing some research, you won't, you might can find out more information on where they came from. Criminal records. Criminal records. This is a this is a criminal suit involving the Commonwealth of Virginia against John Slade. If you see right here. In January 1865, he was tried and convicted and ordered to 39 lashes. But that, they didn't stop there. It said, not only more, he's used to be lashed 39 times, but he is to be sold out of the state. When they say sold out of the state, they weren't saying North Carolina. They were saying to Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana. Okay? That is like the top level of hell for a slave to be sold down to the deep south. Because the life lifespan of a slave in Alabama, Mississippi, and so forth, was much shorter than it was in Virginia. Now, why was he? Why, why was why was such a severe punishment placed upon this slave? He forced the slave pass in order to help slaves cross to Union lines in Hanover County. This is toward the end of the Civil War, and the Union forces were moving closer and closer to Richmond. And so, this slave John had forged, was forging slave passes to help slaves to escape to Union lines. Other, other, uh, other types of records found in this part of the, the African-American narrative, 
you know, like we mentioned, free, no, free, free Negro certificates, freedom suits, petitions to remain in the Commonwealth, deeds of emancipation, enslavement, and uh, petitions for enslavement, and so forth, are all, these are all records that have been scanned so far and indexed so far as part of this African American narrative. Now, some couple complementary collections that are part of the African American narrative will be like the Virginia Chronicle. This is where our this is where our newspapers that have been scanned and indexed, and they are they can be searched now through VirginiaMemory.com. These are online, and so through you can search, do keyword search in newspapers for like runaway slave ads, uh, slave auctions, and so forth to get more information on African Americans prior to the war. For example, here. This is in one newspaper where I just typed in a search for runaways. You come up with all these runaway slave ads uh, where uh, owners are trying to recover their slaves who escaped. They give a lot of information about the, about the slaves, about their features, their physical characteristics, uh, where they worked at, where they were last seen, and so forth. So that's um, <clears throat> one, uh, one complimentary source. The other one is the Chancery Records Index which we have online. Uh, the Chancery Records, to talk about them in detail will be another talk, but just to give you a brief overview, these are court cases that were heard in localities, and they were rich in narrative, because a lot of these cases involved in state disputes and, and divorce and so forth, and so there's a lot of uh, depositions, a lot of background information about, these, about the events. Now, you can, we made it easy for you to search for slaves in our Chancery Records Index, and this is in the handouts that were out there, this, this slide here. But if you select a locality, and in the surname field, put includes the tilde symbol, like you see on your keyboard, the little tilde symbol. Those are what we, how we identify slaves in the Chancery records. And so forth, we got about, I think, 70, 80,000 slave names in the Chancery records index alone. And so if you did a search, you, know, you, do, you click search, for, you, these are court cases in King William County that had slave names. Look at here, 1890, 1889. They're talking about events that happened during, during the slave days, pre-Civil War uh, here. So just, just because a court case with an end date of 1890, don't think it wouldn't have anything referencing pre-Civil War, because they, they will. Now the case in Rockbridge County here, you see list of names of the slaves, John Tilliday, Joshua Tilliday. These are all slave names that were found in this Rockbridge County Chancery case uh, involving the executive Hugh Adams and the legatees of Hugh Adams. Well, the legatees of Hugh Adams are the slaves. Hugh Adams left property to the, when he died, he emancipated his slaves and left property that would help fund transporting them to Liberia. He wanted them sent to Liberia. Well, when the uh, when the slaves knew that their master had died, they knew what they knew what was in the will. They knew what was. They had ways of figuring out what's in in their master's will. So they knew that they were going to be emancipated. And they knew that they were going to be sent, probably sent to Liberia. So after the, not long after he died, the slaves went on a shopping spree to a nearby town and just bought up all kinds of stuff, food, clothes, and everything, and put it all on their former master's tab <laughs> and credited it to his estate. And when the executor saw that, he says, I'm not paying all that. I'm not paying, the money's gonna come out of their fund to go to Liberia. <laughs> so they had to work it out in a court case how that was gonna happen. But they did end up going to Liberia and here, uh, here is a letter written by one of Adam's sworn slaves, former slaves from Liberia, describing what life is like in Liberia, and what the what the food is like, what the uh, uh, weather is like, and so forth, and how things are going in Liberia. That was used as an exhibit in that court case. We also have slave trader records. Most of them are exhibits in Chancery records. You'll see some of them in the To Be Sold exhibition. This is a uh, slave trader's account book from Munenberg County that was used as an exhibit in the Chancery suit there. Give the names of the slaves, how old they were, how much they were valued. And then over here, who they were sold to and for how much they were sold. So you can find the names of the people who purchased 
these lakes. These are individuals, these are people from Florida, Alabama, Louisiana. So if you were to do like a 18 users to do a census search for those names, uh, the, the people who purchased the slaves, you might get an idea where these slaves ended up. <coughs> Now here, uh, in that same account book, is the story of Hester Jane. You see here a list of these are slaves who were, how much they were bought in Virginia and how much they were sold down in Mississippi. Hester here, she was bought for $750 but was never sold. By her name is the word free. If you want to know her story, you go right around the corner into the exhibition hall and you'll see in the exhibition the story of Hester Jane Carr, how a free person ended up a slave. So I'm going to let y'all read that story over there. Finally, I'm going to tell you the story of Oliver and George. And the purpose of this is to show you that we have local collect records collections, state records collections, private papers collections, special collections, and newspapers. But they're not all in their own silos. The story of an African American beginning in local records and will continue on in the state records collection and can be continued on in the newspaper collection and so forth and so on. So if you want to know the whole story, you don't just stop at looking at local records or looking at state records. Look, at, look across the aisles. And the main purpose of this African American narrative is trying to make it easier online to incorporate all these records into one source, into one site, as, as best possible. And to give you an example of how this cross-pollination works, you have the local records collection, the court case involving Oliver and George, they were, on, they were found guilty of stealing several thousand dollars worth of bacon and other things from this warehouse. And in February 1865, they were tried and convicted and sentenced to be hung on March 17, 1865. Well, I wanted to know, was there, you know, typically when you have these uh, capital punishment cases, there's an appeal to the governor to try to pardon someone from being executed. Sure enough, I went to the governor's records in our state records collection and found where the governor pardoned Oliver and George from being hung. And in fact, he says, I heard the evidence from a preacher and from the slave owners of Oliver and George, and based on their petitions, I've agreed not to have them executed. Well, part of the arrangement was, and I saw this, I went to the newspapers and found this about Oliver and George in the newspaper. Pardon, two Negroes, Oliver and George, convicted recently of burglary, to be hung on the 17th of March, have been pardoned by the governor upon condition of their volunteering in the military service of the Confederacy. So you have a choice. Join the Confederate Army or be hung. Oliver and George were mustered into the Confederate Army. They didn't have to serve very long. They cost <laughs> within three weeks. It's over. <laughs> So how can you help out with the African American narrative? We have a transcription site on virginiamemory.com. We're putting these documents online so that you can transcribe these documents. If you go back to my first slide with Jane Webb's story, that's the 18th century handwriting. It's kind of hard to read. And so what we're asking people to do through crowdsourcing on the transcription site is to be able to transcribe those documents so that they can be readable and accessible to the public. You know, if people who have a hard time reading that type of handwriting. So you can help out with this African American narrative by having these documents transcribed. They're going to be put into their same as PDFs and they will be searchable online as part of the African American narrative once this goes online. So this is where you can help tell the stories that we're finding because well, like I said we've got only two guys back here who are doing it part time. So we need you to help us out with the transcription of these documents so that they can be more made more accessible. Also, you can find what the African American records we have here in the Library of Virginia by going to Virginia, uh, Virginia Her the Virginia Heritage site. This is a finding aid site. And you can search by, by African American by Repository Library of Virginia, and they'll pull up African American related records here at the Library of Virginia. Collections from various localities and state government records and so forth. Click on the title, it'll give you more information about what type of documents you'll find in that collection. All of these links are in the handouts that were at the outside, so be sure to pick one up. And again, what we want to do is to 
break down these wall, this wall of 18, this pre-Civil War era for African Americans. We talk about the wall of the pre-Civil War. It's hard to do research. Well, in the collections that we have here, particularly with the local records collection as well as state records collection is, the resources are there. It's just try, getting them out of those bundles, getting them out of those drawers, and making them accessible to, to you, the public, and that's what we're trying to do. You know, through our archivists, through our IT staff here, and so forth. So, any questions on anything? Of those slave petitions that went to the General Assembly, do you have any notion the number that were rejected, the number that were approved? Not really. I, you know, I haven't sat down and done that type of research. But just on the what I've seen so far, the ones I've looked at predominantly to get rejected. There's a few that have been accepted, but mostly rejected. I found one where in Halifax County, they were, it was rejected, and they, were, they moved to Ohio. They, the family moved from Halifax County to Ohio as a, a free, free state. But they had property still from their master who left them in a will, property in Halifax County. So they sued from Ohio in Halifax County Court in order to get back their property, try to get back their property. And I was able to determine through those records where exactly what town they moved to in Ohio. That's good stuff. Any other comments or questions? Have you found any documents um, tying North Carolina with Virginia? Oh, yes. Yes, particularly in those Halifax County Chancery Causes yeah. that will probably be online within the next year. Because okay. there was a lot of cross going back and forth yeah. from North Carolina to Ohio, uh, to Virginia, particularly down south there. Right. But yes, uh, we found district court cases from Brunswick County going back to the 1700s where someone was originally purchased in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. it, it, gave, it was in a part of a freedom suit. She had to give the background. I was bought in North Carolina, brought to Virginia, brought illegally to Virginia. Mm -hmm. And so she based that for her to get her, try to get her freedom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I noticed in some of my research that I originally thought my family, my mother's side, was from Southampton, but mm -hmm. now I'm finding yep. North Carolina. Mm -hmm. okay. Is there a hope to put this all under one umbrella? So that if I went in to do a search, I'd only have to go to one place, or is it still because I, um, or is it going to kind of still you have to go to all the different collections to do the searches? Yes, one place. <laughs> That's the long term goal. <laughs> We're in the process of developing um, kind of an initial place for the stuff to live, in the hopes that we can then expand it as it grows. But this is kind of like a. A, what do we call it, like a proof of concept phase, mm -hmm. but I mean, yeah, that's the long-term goal. Okay. Yeah. I mean, because a lot of the records I've noticed are going up, mm -hmm. and are at least indexed so that you can get access to them, but then to be able to go and just do a search in one place is, like a lot of sites, it's frustrating when you realize you have to go to four different places. Yeah, so. Is there a date for that? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Have you started crowdsourcing yet? Well, the, the transcription, yes. With the transcription, that's going on as we speak. They're getting transcribed every day. The documents, we're adding new, new documents all of, about every, every other week, something like I know when, that was when we you know, started doing the Making History transcription site, we put up documents on, on a Friday. I get back money and I hear from Sonia Coleman, who, who oversees this process for us. I need more documents because you've all been transcribed over the weekend. So we love that. We want to because we got sixty-five thousand documents that need to be transcribed, and uh, so more that get transcribed, more we can put up there. Are they being transcribed and then sent back to the courthouse, or once, or you bring them here and they, they stay? stay here? It is the, they, the records that have been transferred here from localities typically stay here. Once they get here, yeah, once they, they get here, they stay. If the clerk wants the records back, then. The, that, that can happen. That's rare because clerks need space in their courthouses right. for modern day stuff. So once they are transcribed, they st still stay here. But that Kurt, if you were go to go to that courthouse looking for something, yeah. she would know that they didn't stay Yes. Hopefully she would. She would. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
just an off the wall question. I know that Latter Day Saints do a lot of genealogy stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how much is focused on African American. Is there? Do you guys coordinate anything or? No, not really. Totally independent of each other. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, I mean, there's opportunities for partnerships with like ancestry or family search and so forth. But uh, pretty much what we're doing has been on our own. Okay. Uh, however, the transcription part of it, uh, you know, they may be, they, they, you know, they may be involved in that because we've been giving these talks to, you know, Latter Day Saint churches and, and organizations and so forth who are into genealogy. They love transcribing. So, I assume somebody here is checking the transcription. Yes, they're being edited. <laughs> they're, they're being edited. Yeah, that's part of what Ed and Chris do also is to oversee the or do the editing of the transcriptions along with other staff at the library here. They are doing editing to ensure that they're, they're being done correctly. I mean, you know, sometimes I hear from them, some, they're really great, and then sometimes they're like, well, you know, I'm not sure what they're trying to say here. And I'll give a shout out to um, the Library Services and Technology Act for funding us to check these records. Yeah. Um, that's being done through a grant, so part of a very small part of my salary is actually being covered, not by state dollars, but by federal funds to do this, as several other people in this room. And, you know, the goal, you know, ultimately is like, I, my thing, my thing, I've been personally involved with this from the beginning, and this is my person, Rick speaking here, is this is not a Library of Virginia only project. I, will, I would love to see this grow to partnerships with other institutions, not only here in Virginia, but also regionally in the South to, 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 to kind of develop this because of the law. A lot of, there was a lot of migration of African Americans pre-Civil War era due to the internal slave trade. As you saw from the slave trade account book, all of these you know, slaves from Virginia are being shipped down to Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama. Well, their stories continue down there, so I'd love to work with someone down in New Orleans or down in Mississippi or Alabama to see what's the rest of the story like and see how this could be incorporated into a larger project. But, you know, I'm thinking big here. Sorry. Anybody else? Being from New Orleans, and since you mentioned it, is any of that information left since the flood? What's that? Storm, the flood. The, the, since the storm, is any? Do you know if any of that information is left in New Orleans? I'm not sure. That's a good question. I'm not sure what the status because of the records were the down there. City and state buildings were flooded. Yeah. I'm not sure where their archives was located at down there, so I don't know how, what the status is. Let me tell one more story and I'll let you go. This is a Chancery case involving Thomas Coleman. Thomas Coleman was a free African American who was a blacksmith in Brunswick County. Very skilled blacksmith based on the fact that we have a part of this Chancery case case or in the exhibits are dozens, dozens upon dozens of receipts of people he did business with and people who did business with him. He was very popular as a blacksmith. But in the middle, and these receipts came out of his billfold. This was Thomas Coleman's wallet. And all those receipts were tightly packed into this wallet. You might can tell a lot about a person by what they have in their wallet. And you can tell a lot about who Thomas Coleman was based on all those receipts. He was a very prominent blacksmith. You know, a lot of people did work with him. Now, in the middle, in the middle of all those receipts was found this little piece of paper. And this little piece of paper says, Mary Coleman has been to see my wife. Please permit her to go to Tom Coleman's shop. M -L -W -F Thomas. If you read the Chancery suit, Mary Coleman was his wife. What, well, why would she need to have this with her to go see her husband? She was a slave. Tom was a free African American. She, his wife was a slave and he had children by her. And so in his wallet was her slave pass, allowing her to go see him at his shop. 
And the Chancery case talks about, you know, get to, through their children arm, it's the names of the children, his wife, his occupation as a blacksmith in Brunswick County, and her efforts to receive their fair share of Tom Coleman's estate. He died during the middle of the Civil War. And the administrator, who was white, was having a difficult time giving all what was owed to her and her children. He was a pretty, made pretty good money as a blacksmith, you look at all these receipts. But the administrator said, oh, the war was going on, oh, I couldn't, didn't have time, blah, blah, blah. Well, 10 years, 15 years later, he gets sued in Brunswick County. And so what little was left was given to his widow and his children. Slave passing, no receipts. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your time. I'll be up here to answer any questions you might have. Thank you.